Hi, I'm Hamish Black, and welcome to Writing on Games. When I've talked about certain games not working in any other form before, the games in question tend to be these lofty deconstructions of the medium that have you reflecting on your actions or whatever. Which is why it's perhaps odd that, upon hearing word that a film adaptation of 2012 Sleeping Dogs was in the works, I was sceptical in the way I would be had you told me that Hellblade was being turned into a movie, for example. In a way, it's a similar problem I foresee the upcoming Uncharted film having, namely that you make that movie, don't be surprised when you end up with a pale imitation of Indiana Jones. But I feel that the potential issues with Sleeping Dogs go deeper than that. There isn't that disconnect you have with Uncharted where you've taken a certain film franchise and turned it into a stop and pop shooter. To hear the developers talk about it, Sleeping Dog's identity is far more intrinsically tied to the Hong Kong action films that inspired it, but the beauty lies in what it does with this influence, using its mechanics and systems to fully place you at the centre of an undercover cop martial arts thriller. You can see this vision in the game's use of the Batman Arkham Combat system, for example, rewarding simple inputs and recognition of visual cues with intense animations. Fluidity becomes the priority as you treat each encounter as if it were a rhythm game more than a brawler, reflecting the way a director like John Woo views his own action scenes, for example. You can also see it in the game's world design. Over the many hours of your playtime, you get used to navigating the winding, neon-draped streets of Hong Kong to the extent that the city becomes a character in itself, leading to moments between missions where you aren't necessarily focused on the plot, but the detail of the open world is consistently establishing a sense of place nonetheless. That's something you just don't get with a bunch of expedited establishing shots in a movie, no matter how good they might look. But in revisiting it, perhaps the most impressive part of Sleeping Dog's vision is that it doesn't just stop at the game's combat. Arguably the main reason Sleeping Dogs can only work as a game is that it manages to gamify the complicated morality of being an undercover cop at the core of so many of its cinematic influences. Again, it might seem weird to say this considering that the story of Sleeping Dogs isn't particularly complicated in any way. I mean, stop me if you've heard this one before. Undercover Cop gets in too deep and begins to question his loyalties, having to convince his higher-ups that he's different from the criminals he's been sent in to bring down. It's Infernal Affairs, it's hard-boiled, police story, it's an effective one of those, but at the end of the day, it's still just one of those. But that's where Sleeping Dog's morality system comes in, managing to avoid the pitfalls of the many similar systems found in games around that time, the ones that would treat morality as a simple good and bad binary. Protagonist Wei Shen's struggle is more complicated than that. He's neither morally righteous in his duties as a cop, nor a totally unhinged maniac as a triad foot soldier. He's trapped in and trying to make sense of a strange and dangerous situation. Now how does the game make you feel this moral struggle, you might ask? Well, by making being an objectively good cop really goddamn hard. See, in Sleeping Dogs you have two scoring systems during missions, triad and cop points. Triad points are associated with fighting enemies, while cop points line up with, you guessed it, obeying the law. As you gain more points in each, Wei gains more abilities along two separate skill trees, meaning you're incentivized to keep both as high as possible. Where this contributes to the story is the way in which you're scored on each. Your triad score is a blank slate, starting at zero and filling up as you dispatch your foes using whatever grisly method takes your fancy. Your cop meter, on the other hand, starts full and gradually declines as you mess up, from things as extreme as running over civilians to being clumsy with a parkour prompt. Put simply, your triad score is a reward for creativity, your cop score is punitive towards stepping out of line, and crucially, both are active at the same time. It is possible to fulfil both your requirement to the gritty world of the triad and maintain your reputation as a police officer, but it's a remarkably difficult tightrope to walk. To be a good cop, you have to go against the urges countless open world crime games have hammered into your head. The world is no longer your oyster, you could cut that corner to more effectively pursue your target, but you'd be endangering lives. How about that enticing sick jump over there? Well, make sure you don't land on a fence, heaven forfend you do some damage to property. After a while, it becomes easier and easier to forgo the niceties of being a police officer in favour of a more bombastic approach, mirroring Wei's decline. 
And what's great about all of this is that at the end of the day, it falls on you to police yourself. In other games of this ilk, the police act as a means of resetting the balance of the world. As you do more and more daft video game shit, the game pushes back against you with increasing severity to stop you from feeling totally indestructible. In Sleeping Dogs, it's actually difficult to get any kind of wanted level outside of scripted moments, meaning that the constant decline of that meter, its attachment to the development of your character, is the only thing stopping you from going completely off the rails. And it's all in service of asking the question, in a world where we're told that crime doesn't pay, what if it did? You experience the triad lifestyle as enticing, it encourages you to do whatever the hell you want, costs be damned. The cops, by comparison, are framed as the leash around your neck. By having to balance both loyalties at the same time, you feel the struggle that Wei does, trying and failing to maintain distance from the triad he is now a part of. And just think about that for a minute, we get all of this from just a slight rejigging of the way in which morality is given a score during missions. It seems so simple, but speaks to the larger issue that even with what feel like the least complicated games, it's not just the words that tell the story, it's how the words are sold to you through your interactions, the world design, etc. Every little element of a game that simply won't be there in a two hour uninteractive film. And look, I'm sure that Donnie Yen will be more than competent, I'm sure the action scenes will be flashy, and I'm sure you could write some serviceable dialogue to move that action along. What you would be missing out on, however, is the fact that Sleeping Dogs is a simple story well told, and without the means of telling that story well, what you're left with will undoubtedly feel shallow by comparison. So I hope you enjoyed my piece revisiting Sleeping Dogs. If you did, maybe consider hitting subscribe as well as a little bell thingy and check out the podcast in the description. If you feel like going the extra mile, however, you can always check out the Patreon like these wonderful folks currently on screen. I am forever thankful for your continued support. In particular, I'd like to thank Mark B. Writing, Michael Wolf, Artyom Vitsyuk, Spike Jones, Vasily Hrabinka, Chris Wright, Dr. Motorcycle, Harry Fuertes, Ham Migas, Travis Bennett, Zach Casserly, Samuel Pickens, Tom Nash, Shardfire, Philip Lange, Rob, Rusty Shackelford, Anna Pimentel, Jesse Ryan, Brandon Robinson, Diego Fox Obuza, Justin Holderness, Biggie Smith, Peter, Christian Kuneman, Camel Traffic, Nico Blakely, Nicholas Ross, and Charlie Yang. And with that, I'm Hamish Black, and this has been Writing on Games. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time.